Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. This is the beginning of season three of Fading Memories. And with me today is Peggy Sweeney McDonald. She also has a podcast and a book. And as you know, from many of the people I talk to, I'm so impressed by the things that caregivers create during and after their caregiving journey. And that's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. So thanks for joining me, Peggy. Thanks for having me, Jennifer. It's wonderful to be here with you. So tell us about yourself and your family. Give us a little background so we know where to know who we're talking to. Yeah, I'm the oldest of four girls. Um, I live in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where I grew up. After I graduated from LSU years ago, I moved um, to Houston. I was an actress, got my SAG card, then moved to New York, met my husband there. And then we moved to New Orleans and then we moved to L.A. So I was gone from my hometown for 36 years. That's a long time. A long time. Yeah, I was the only daughter that left. My other three sisters are here and have kids. My husband and I married a New Yorker. So we never got around to having kids. We're, I guess we're too self-absorbed. <laughs> so I came back for Easter of 2016. And when I came back for a wedding and for Easter from Los Angeles, I was here for two weeks. I had a chance to go with my sisters and my mom and dad to the neurologist. And my mom was officially diagnosed with Alzheimer's. We knew it was coming. We, But when you hear the doctor say, your mother has Alzheimer's. It just, you know, the reality sinks in as much as it can because you're still in shock and you still don't know what what the next step is. That night, my husband called from LA and he got laid off from his job as a stockbroker. So he said it over the phone because his father had died of Alzheimer's in New York City and he just knew what his mom had gone through. And he said to me, well, I guess the universe just made it real, made the decision easy for us, for us to move back to Louisiana. And I had kind of been campaigning that I was ready. LA had gotten so expensive and I was an event producer, had segued from being an actress to becoming a, a meeting and event producer. And my business, because of the economy, just kept going down and down. Um, and then my husband being laid off because of change management with his company it just it just seemed like it was coming and I had said to him a couple of months before you know I just want to be of service to my parents I think it's time to go home so we ended up I ended up flying back and we for three months we you know purged and put our house on the market sold the house in five weeks and of course um you know I was just like a nervous wreck and got rid of stuff and gave away stuff. And then we moved, um, the movers came and we moved August of 2016. So a couple of months after she was diagnosed in April and we came back on August, like, um, it's probably like August 13th or something. So came back and immediately there was the great flood of Baton Rouge that weekend. And my parents, my mom had planned a party for me and you know, she was still functioning. Um, so I knew that I was going to have some wonderful time with her, you know, still had some good times, but I didn't realize until like that weekend of the flood and we had to evacuate because we were afraid the water was coming up to our backyard and we were afraid we were going to be flooded, but we weren't, but we had to evacuate across town and stay with my sisters because our electricity was out for several days and just seeing the odd behavior that weekend and my mom's anxiety and the stress and how she acted towards my dad and my dad not knowing how to deal with it. So we just kind of knew like we could live with my parents here in this big house and we had our stuff, the movers put our stuff in storage and we just decided, you know, we were going to, I really, my husband wanted to move back to New Orleans where, where he had lived a long time ago, but I just knew we needed to be here in Baton Rouge. So we never left. We stayed, we our stuff still in storage. And we were here living with my mom and dad through the next three years. And then she, um, we moved her into memory care. I guess it was January, the end of January of 2019. And she passed away July 2nd. So just like five and a half months. 
But it was a tough journey. Um, I never had children. So I was, look, I didn't have any idea of how to take care of another person. And, you know, it really humbled me and I learned a lot. And I, it was an emotional, an emotional journey, mentally, physically, it was tough. But we showed up and we were here and we were here for my father, who's now 85 and it's been now a year and a half since she passed away. And I, you know, I always wanted to write about it because I had had a book years ago in 2012. I have a book, a coffee table cookbook with life stories about food called Meanwhile Back at Cafe Du Monde. And so I've been through like the book journey and I was like, I want to write a memoir about this, about this journey of moving home after 36 years. And sharing these stories of like the ups and downs and the life lessons and how I grew as a person spiritually and emotionally and just the whole emotional journey of of life in the A zone. I called it the A zone. Like I was like, we're living in the A zone for Alzheimer's. And I had this idea that I was going going to write a book. And when she passed away, I kept thinking, I need to write, I need to write. And I would look at my laptop every day and I would think, maybe I need to go for a walk. Maybe I need to eat. Maybe I need to eat some sugar. Maybe I need to go watch Netflix. I would do anything but right. And a couple of months later, November of 2019, there was um, the Louisiana Book Festival here in Baton Rouge. And I thought I saw they were having a, a memoir essay writing class. And I said, I should go do that. And I heard my mom's voice saying, Yes, you should go do it, Peggy. And I kept thinking, oh, I don't know. It's only a three hour class. Do I want to spend the money? And I just kept thinking I need to do it. So I went and Jennifer, I have to tell you that day I got dressed up, put makeup on. It was cold outside. There was a cold spell. My dad came in. He goes, it's cold outside. You're going to need a coat. So I had a coat and a hat and a scarf and boots and my leggings. And I went to this class and it changed, it changed my life. I'm telling you, I walked in and I, the, the instructor prompted us to write about something that we were embarrassed or ashamed of. And I wrote about how my mom would wear weird clothes. And my mom, who was a Southern belle who dressed impeccably matchy match, all of a sudden was wearing inside out clothes, dirty, not take, taking a shower, things that wouldn't match. My sisters or my nieces and nephews would be embarrassed if we'd go out. So I wrote that story. And then when I read it back to the class, because we wrote it in 15 minutes and then we read them out loud. And when I read it, I started crying and I looked around when I finished and everybody in the class was crying. And the teacher, she said, you know, you have to do this. You have to write this book. So I started writing the book and I felt when I left that class, I felt alive again. I felt like inspired and like I had a skip in my step and I just had a smile on my face. I felt like oh my gosh, I came, I, I'm alive again. I felt like a, a person again because I had been in so much grief and so much for years, you know. And so I started going to a coffee shop. This is before COVID <laughs> and started writing. And then the beginning of 2020, I kept writing, kept writing. And then COVID happened in March. My husband and I were going to go to Italy and we had to cancel that trip. And my dad was going with taking his nephew, his grandsons, my nephews to Ireland in May and we had to cancel his trip. And so I ended up thinking, had this idea that it would be a great podcast sharing these stories because I just didn't have the energy to start trying to publish a book, self-publish or try to find a publisher. And my original publisher does coffee table books that they weren't be, wouldn't be right for this. So I, you know, had this idea that I should podcast it. And I told a couple of girlfriends and one of them told me about these guys in Baton Rouge who have a studio who help people get started. So I made an appointment for my birthday, July 21st of last of this 2020. And on that day, I went and taped the first three stories. And I, it's been, it was just like, it happened really fast. I had the idea on July 1st, July 29th, it came out. I now have 20 episodes. It starts from the decision when my mom was diagnosed and the decision to move back. And it goes all through the next three years through, you know, the struggle and how everything changed into like us moving her to memory care those last few months. And then to uh, episode 20 is when she passed away. And we were all there in her memory care room, all four girls, 
and my dad, we all spent the night. And so anyway, it's been an incredible journey sharing the story and have people from all over the world listening, as you know, you know, it's like, we tell our stories and people listen, you know, if you build it, they will come yeah, <laughs> that like, is put true. It out there in the world. And I hope people are saying it's helping them. And it's been, um, you know, uh, being able to take being an actress and a writer and then going through the struggle and putting that all on paper and then sharing the stories. It's been it's been a beautiful journey. Well, I listened to the first episode, like I said, last week, and unfortunately, I do most of my own editing and everything. So I end up listening to my own podcast all the time. <laughs> it really cuts into the time I have available for other podcasts. But what I loved about yours is, you know, that it's narrative and it's telling the story. And even though your story is very different than mine, it just, I felt a connection. And that's what I really like about podcasts because I feel like I like to tell people that Fading Memories is like your caregiver best friend. You know, you can tune in and get information and inspiration. And at, at this point, and I bet you it will change. And there is, I don't know if you've heard of the app Clubhouse, but at some point there'll probably be an interactive quality to podcasts. <laughs> I don't know how that'll work completely, but I mean, we could do it live, but I'm not ready for all that craziness at this point. So I wanted to go back a little bit and ask you what went into making the decision to move her to a memory care residence? Because I know people struggle with that. And I know 90% of the people wait too long. And then it's like, my my dad should have, my parents should have been in assisted living. It would have been very beneficial for my dad and my mom. But, you know, as most people of their generation, they were not even, that was not even a consideration. And so after he died, which was March of 2017, we, you know, because my sister has school age children and my daughter had just moved out and I had just turned 50. I'm like, I'm not ready to give up all of my freedoms to take care of her because 74 at the time. And so I thought, you know, this could be easily 10 or 15 years. I have questioned whether I would have made a different decision if I had known it wouldn't have been that long. I don't think I would have made a different decision. I don't know. It's it's probably not a brain game I should play with myself, but most people wait too long. They agonize over the whole decision and just makes it makes the process worse. So what was your what was the trigger? My sister, who's an attorney, my sister, Shannon, she's the one, the voice of reason, you know, <laughs> so she kept talking about it and saying we need to do it. And my father and I were just horrified. We just like could not imagine moving my mom and how angry she would be and we were just like, no, she's not ready. She's not ready. And then when we went to to look at different memory care facilities and we see people and wheelchairs and drooling on themselves and stuff, I'm like, no, mom's not like that. You know, she's going to freak out if we put her there because she's not like all those other people. But, you know, because you only see like what you see. And there were other people who weren't that bad that weren't in wheelchairs. But, you know, that's all we saw when you first go in there. So what happened was my mom started wandering and leaving the house and she would get really mad at my father. She became really combative and mean and just she told him she wanted her own apartment. She wanted a divorce. You know, it was like really, really emotionally abusive to my dad that he had to listen to that, you know, on a daily basis and that she wanted to move in with her mother and he would argue and say, your mother's gone. Your mother's been dead. She wanted to move in with her brother. Her brother had died the year before. So she would just get mad and pick up a purse and leave. And then we would realize, you know, we wouldn't realize she was gone. So we had to put the alarm on so that that annoying, I have a podcast about that annoying beep beep. Every time somebody walks in and walks out, we had to set the alarm so that we would know that she left. And it just got to be just too much. And then the clincher, which really was the whole fine, like the straw that broke the camel back was when she picked up the fireplace shovel and she threatened to hit my dad over the head because he was lying to her that this was her home because she no longer believed that this was her home. They would, he would take her to lunch and they would come back and she's like, oh no, you're not doing this again. I'm not going in those people's home. Take me home. And he's like, <laughs> he'd sit in the van going, this is your house. No, that's not. And she told me one day, she said, Peggy, these people are going to find out we're living in their house. And 
really concerned. And so she got just really paranoid. And then I came home one day and my dad said it was the worst day. And every day I I was working an event planning job kind of part time. And when I'd come home and say, how was the day? And he's like, oh, it was awful. And he'd say, you know, tell me what had happened. And that day he said she picked up the fireplace shovel and threatened to hit me over the head because I was lying to her. And she carried it around all day. Yeah. And I said, oh, my gosh, Dad, what if, you know, if you were taking a nap in your chair and she hit you over the head? I mean, so I had I remember, Jennifer, going upstairs, picking up my cell phone and texting my sisters. And I did not want to hit send. But told him, I said, you know, I knew that when I hit send that I was pulling the trigger on my mom moving into memory care. And I just sat there on the edge of my bed and I just knew that I had to do the right thing. And that once I sent that text, my sister Shanna would say, that's it. And she did. She said, that's it. I'm going to the memory care place that we think she, she'd be good at. And within a day, they had the deposit down and we were making plans for the next weekend. And I was like, oh, my God, this is too soon. How are we going to do this? And of course, I'm having to like pack her stuff up and, you know, she'd be ha- watching TV with my dad and I'd go in her closet and grab a stuff, bunch of stuff and put in the you know, secret suitcases upstairs. And my sisters were figuring out who had furniture and storage that they could move into the, you know, because she was going to have her own little like, room studio with her own little, you know, refrigerator and stuff, own bathroom. But it was really hard. And, you know, we basically my sister came over with her husband that Sunday morning and said, Come on, mom, we're going to lunch and took her there. You know, so and I just laid on that couch and cried my eyes out. I just couldn't believe and then you're like, what do you you feel so lost because you've been you know, I was cooking and cleaning and Fighting with her to bathe, that was another thing. She wasn't bathing anymore. It would be a huge fight to try to get her in the shower. It just, I just, and I just couldn't do it anymore. I was going crazy. I felt like I was going insane because of her, the insanity of trying to deal with someone who has Alzheimer's. I felt like I was starting to lose it. And I literally, a year before we moved her, I finally went to my mom's like general doctor to get help. And she said, Peggy, I'm surprised to see your name on the list. When the doctor came in, she goes, I'm surprised to see you here today. And I, she goes, are you, how are you? And I said, I'm a mess. And I started crying. And she said, of course you are. You're living with Alzheimer's. You know, yep. your sisters have no idea what it's like to live 20, you know, 24 seven. And she said, you know, you're depressed. You have anxiety. Like I, I couldn't even put the name to all that. Cause I've just felt like I was just an emotional mess and I couldn't sleep. And so she said, if you're not getting rest and, you know, you need some sleeping aids, you need some antidepressants, you need to take care of yourself because if you don't take care of yourself. You're going to get sick. It was a tough journey. That's yeah. all, I'm, you know. Well, I'm going to come back to the you having to go to the doctor. And I haven't talked about it in quite a while, but when my dad died, we had, my sister and I don't agree on anything. And we had agreed that we would talk to her youngest sister, mom's youngest sister, who took care of their mom. And I've, I've, I've stated this before. I do not understand the lack of decision making, but my aunt took care of her mom living on my grandmother's social security. So guess what happened when my grandmother died? My aunt is basically a ward of the state. She's on welfare and subsidized housing and the whole nine yards. And I just... It infuriates me that family caregivers get stuck in that that boat because that's not what my aunt would have wanted or, you know, but it's just what happened. And I guess she's accepting it. And my aunt has her own mental health struggles. So I, there's a lot of a lot of dynamics that play into that. My aunt basically said we were going to have my aunt live with mom. We were going to hire a caregiver to come in at, least, at probably two so that there would be somebody eight hours a day, seven days a week. Because my aunt didn't need to do that 24 hours a day because we already knew how hard it was. And that would have just been my aunt's was is eight years younger than my mom or is it 11? I think it's 11 years younger than my mom. And still, you know, she didn't need to do that. And she told my sister and I that she was not interested. And prior to that, being a planner and being kind of pessimistic. I thought about like worst case scenarios. Okay. When mom goes first, 
and then this and then that. And I started thinking about it. I'm like, I can't do this. I'm not comfortable with this choice that my sister and I have agreed on, which that was miraculous. So I started looking around at memory care, not facilities, residences, and found one that would take her and her dog. And it was like, here's money. <laughs> take money. I'm securing a spot for her. And then when my dad passed away, I called him and I said, okay, well, my dad's gone. I don't know how long we should give mom. And they're like, we have space. Just bring her because it's not going to get any easier so my sister and I basically set up her room. We put all the family pictures on the wall. We set up her bed. We did everything to make it look as much like home yeah. as possible. But the like first five minutes we're there, very tall resident named Richard is literally wearing pajamas and he's got a stuffed animal stuffed down the back of the pants of the pajamas. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I could do this with my mom. But I'd already had her at my house and I knew I couldn't do that either. So I was like, oh, this is this is not cool. But my mom ended up with friends in the memory care residence to the point where the first Christmas Eve after, you know, so this was Christmas 2017, my sister and brother-in-law went to pick up mom. My sister texted me and said, other Diane is also coming. Hope that's okay. Which with my sister translates, translates to, it's going to be fine because we're all on our way. You know, it was Fortunately, it was totally fine with me. But like you said, your mom, you know, you didn't think she was as bad as some of the people that were there. And that's not an uncommon thing because I guess we kind of have, have a tendency to see the worst things when we yeah. shouldn't be. So I joke, my mom's name was Diane. The gal that showed up at my house on Christmas Eve was other Diane. And then there was a third Diane. So we had other, other Diane. <laughs> So it was very confusing. It was confusing for people who didn't have Alzheimer's, but she would hang out with them. And I mean, they were just like their own little rat pack. And it was, it was really good. And as the other Diane started getting really paranoid and I had kind of noticed that my mom was spending less time with her. And I don't know if that was like my mom's decision or it just happened naturally. But the thing that I found funny and like, um, I don't know, I don't want to say refreshing, but comforting for me was my mom had a specific story she told all the time. And this one day, mom and I and other Diane are visiting together because it was always the three of us. And mom starts in on her story and Diane, other Diane slaps her knee and goes, you've told me that story 803 times. And I kind of <laughs> laughed because I'm like, well, 803 is sort of a specific number. <laughs> and my mom kind of stopped and looked at her like, I have? Huh, well, that's kind of strange. And then maybe a month or so later, and maybe it was longer, it's hard to remember at this point, my mom starts in on the story again, and other Diane literally starts parroting the same story. And I thought, that's insane. Both of these women have Alzheimer's. My mom has told this story so many times that she has programmed this other woman that's with this story. Hilarious. I'm like... I don't know if that's elder abuse or like what, but you know, it's like my mom had somebody that could hear the story 803 plus times and not want to just like smack their head on the wall. Right. Or, I know. know. Well, Jenner, it's weird that you said that because my mom, before we even knew, realized that she had Alzheimer's, she would, you know, my nieces and nephews and they'd all get roll their eyes because she'd tell the same stories over and over again and we would too and and you know we'd all be at really annoyed but you know now I would take any of those stories again you know when they're gone that you're like oh I would I would even take a bad day you know I, I would love to hear my mom's stories you know I, I would love to have her tell me one one more story that I'd heard a million times I'm just not to have her presence that yeah mm -hmm. i'm not ready to hear the same story again it was about <laughs> dogs she's like, i've had dogs all my life i'd be like oh god <laughs> quick <laughs> distract distract mm -hmm. it's just awful because she did this i mean i heard this story for years and trust me if a woman that mom lived with could repeat the story that is how often my mother told this story <laughs> it was terrible but mm -hmm. i there's days and probably a lot of it's because you know we were locked up so to speak because of the pandemic for so long 
my mom and I would go out to the park or the pool or the library because she just loved to watch kids being a mom and a grandma that made her happy. I didn't have to hear the dog story 15 times in 20 minutes. So that made me happy. And we wouldn't have been able to go out like for a whole year plus. So I would just love to be able to like, just go hang out in the park with her. That's kind of my, my one like thing that I kind of miss, although it was really challenging because her visual processing was so bad that we had to basically stick to the paved walkways. And then I would like literally put like the folding lawn chairs on the edge of the grass, like right up against the, the walkway, because as soon as her feet touched the grass, you'd get this whole arm circling like, oh, and it's like, lady, the grass is flat and it's mowed. It's not even long. So like, it's just a little, little squishier than the paved walkway. Like, please yeah. stop. You know, so we couldn't, couldn't walk far into the park and it was a big challenge, but we had some fun times in the park. My favorite memory, it must have been July 4th weekend or whatever, whenever the 4th of July was in 2019. Yeah, because she died in 2020. We were in the park, lots of bunting and 4th of July Independence Day decorations going up. And I was recording a little social media v video and I said, you know, hey, everybody, happy 4th of July. And I said, you say it, mom. And she said, company, pe people, company. And I thought, huh, that's a pretty interesting twist on happy 4th of July. And it's like, it was just fascinating that that's how her brain popped out what I like the sentiment. And so I miss stuff like that. But mm, I, yeah, you know. I, miss, I miss watching Dancing with the Stars or the voice with my mom. She loved music and she loved dancing. And I, I miss dancing with her even towards the end. You know, I'd put on music and we would jump up and dance in the living room and even at the memory care unit, but they used to, one of the uh, caregivers, caretakers would play music on her. I'd come in in the afternoon and she'd be playing music on her iPhone, you know, and I'd always grab my mom and we would dance, you know, towards the end, she was in a wheelchair the last few, you know, the, like the last three weeks. So, and she couldn't even walk anymore. She was so weak. because She stopped eating. Mm. So we couldn't dance anymore, but um, that was, I have such good memories. You know, whenever I put music on, it just would l light her up like a Christmas tree and she'd get her sparkle and her smile again and that light in her eyes. And there, I have this video where the woman um, was playing Whitney Houston singing, I will always love you. And my mom and I are her dancing and I'm singing to her and the, the caregiver took my phone and videotaped it. And it's the cutest video. I mean, I look horrible. I look, I'm so much, I gained so much weight. Thank God I'm, you know, letting a lot of that go, but just had gained weight from not working out and eating sugar and not eating right, eating my feelings. So I look at this video and I'm like, oh my God, I look like <laughs> horrible. <laughs> But, um, you know, it, but it's still, I'm never going to delete that video. It's on my phone because it's my mom and I dancing, you know, and it's like one of the last times we danced together. That's kind of actually how the my podcast started. I kept looking for ways to engage with her that were positive and happy and, and things that, you know, happy for her. Because if she was happy, then I was happy. And everybody's like, oh, music, music, music. And oh, Music never worked with her. I finally did find some songs. My mom loved talk radio. And so sometimes when we were in my car, I'd put on a podcast for her, but she never really engaged with it. I think if I had um, had the opportunity to just like put headphones on her so she could hear either my voice or whoever, because, you know, there's only like a million podcasts. <laughs> and I think she would have actually really loved podcasts if she had been in her right mind when they those became popular, you know, three or four years ago. So it was, that was a big challenge, but <clears throat> you brought it up again about the weight gain and eating your feelings and all that. And a lot of caregivers do not realize, or they don't accept or admit to themselves that being under chronic stress, blah, 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 my mouth does not want to say that <laughs> being under chronic mm -hmm. stress is so harmful for our bodies. And then, you know, like you said, you don't eat right. You don't get enough sleep. 
you know, that can lead to your own cognitive issues or cancers or diabetes. It's like, I always made decisions for about my mom with everybody in mind because, and this may sound, you know, really heartless, but it's like, there are those of us like, okay, when my mom went into memory care, I had just turned 50. So my sister was almost 47. I'm like, some of us are going to be around a little while. Thank hopefully, you know, God willing. I have to like consider yeah. everybody's needs, not just the needs of my mom, which obviously her needs were important, but I couldn't always, I couldn't always make her needs a priority over like mine or my sister or my niece or my, my nephew is on the autism spectrum. And so sometimes you just had to make decisions that the way I feel right now, like I, I knew if I went and visited my mom and if I was tired or stressed or my to-do list was just spinning in my head, like, you know, like a bad movie, she would, I didn't, wouldn't even have to say anything. She'd pick up on it and we'd have a fight and then the visit would be terrible. And then it just, just got worse from there. So sometimes it's like, you know, I either had to like really suck it up and just shove all those feelings aside, or I had to pick a different day to go, which was difficult with my schedule the way it was. I had a specific time that was hers. And the other thing that I had, to, like one day the doctor called me up and said, why did, you know, this was like 1130 in the afternoon or morning. Well, wait, the doctor wants you to bring your mom in, back in today. Oh, really? Well, I can't do that. You can't like, no, I work. You do like, are you kidding me? Like, do I look like I'm old enough to be retired or did somehow do I dress like I'm like independently wealthy? Cause I don't think either of those things are the case. It was just ridiculous. You know, I know a lot of people that will just drop everything and Kate, you know, the doctor did not need to see my mom that day. We needed to have a conversation about moving forward with some testing and whether or not it was worth the time. Because this was July of 2019. And, you know, she passed away in March of 2020. So, you know, obviously there was a lot of things they wanted to do that weren't, weren't necessary, in my opinion. And you just have to learn how to advocate for yourself and your loved one and the extended family. And that's a lot of work by itself. So I, I'm trying to help caregivers learn that, yes, you need to take good care of your loved one, but taking care of yourself is equally important, especially because if you don't take care of yourself, you may end up sick. And then what's going to happen with your loved one? Because that's what happened with my dad. He did all the caretaking, did not want my sister and I to help, did not accept offers of help. And then he ended up in the hospital for 32 days. And my sister and my mom and I were like, we bounced mom and the dog around and that was ugly. And ugh, it was just, it was all bad. So I try to, I try to, Tell that story so other people will not go down a similar path. It's not fun. Well, and when we first moved her in memory care, we were like trying to go every day, you know, and my dad was gone every day. And then you realize she's being taken care of and that we don't need to go every day, you know, and our, we can go for an hour. I don't need to go and sit there for four hours. And my thing was, I like to go and go into her room and lay down with her. My thing was just to lay down on the, my mom's bed and hold her like, you know, do spoons and let, put some pretty music on. We had a little one of those little, um, you know, Alexa boxes on her bed stand. So I would say, Alexa, play Barbara Streisand, Pandora Station or Alexa, play Frankie Valley or play Celine Dion. And or play some pretty piano music. And I would just like say, aren't you tired, mom? Don't you want to go take a nap? Because I just wanted to lay there and hold her and just, you know, my other sisters would go and talk or show her pictures. But I just I just wanted to just hold my mom. And so many days, I'd, you know, I'd go there and she'd be getting ready to eat dinner and I'd sit with her and try to, you know, try to make her eat. At the end, she wasn't eating at all. And that was a battle, just trying to get her to drink some protein drink or have a few bites of yogurt or some apple juice. But, um, you know, I'd always say, let's get to your room. And I just wanted to have one on one time with my mom. I didn't want to sit with everybody. You know, I know they usually after dinner, they would bring them into the t the living room area and have some kind of activity. But 
when I was there, I was selfish. I was just like, I want to just go <laughs> hold my mom and hold her tight and have her. We, I just would lay behind her and ha- have my hand a- across her waist and she would hold my hand and just be in there. And, you know, we didn't have to talk. She didn't want to talk a lot, you know, at the end, but just being there and holding her and just, just breathing together, you know, it was just, and I, I just think of that all the time. I'm so grateful that I did that. That's one of the things I try to teach people is make a decision. And sometimes you have to make a tough decision where when they're gone, you won't say, dang it, I should have done X. You might think, I wish I had done more of Y, or I can see how I would go after lunch on Mondays. And in the beginning, I'd spend two, two and a half hours with mom. And she thought I was her best friend. So like laying on the bed, it's like, no, she would not have gone for that. <laughs> so she she liked to sit around and chit chat because that's what you do with your friends, right? I like to take her out because, you know, it was harder for my sister because, you know, she's got the kids and the kids have all their activities and they did activities after lunch and she just was not really capable of participating. And so she didn't, she would sit around while other people did it. But I would just take her out just for change of scenery for her. I felt that was good for her. It was good for me. And I just lost my train of thought. I hate it when that happens. Where would you take her, Jennifer? You actually took her off the property? Oh, yeah. We'd go early on. We would go. We are blessed to be near two regional parks. And so I would take her to one or the other, depending on the time of year. One of them actually has some like wide walking trails up the hills to a let's see well it's a it's a cave and they used to mine silver and then it was sand i think i don't remember if it was silver my own personal history here in town and i'm like forgetting what the history what did they i think it was silver and uh, but then it mostly it was sand and it was enough of an effort of walking that it was beneficial for her but it wasn't like steep and it wasn't too challenging except for the one time we went in the spring and the the sunlight was coming through the the oak tree branches and the shadows on the ground confused her and she's literally stepping around the shadows and i'm like oh my gosh (gasps) so yeah we would do that and then the other regional park is flatter and it has like a lagoon pool it's a swimming pool next to a water reservoir just kind of a strange, I'm not really sure why they've constructed it this way. And it has one of those beach entries so you can just walk in. So obviously that was easy for her. Why they put sand in the swimming pool in the shallow end, I did not understand. And it was enough sand that it would shift under your feet, which would freak her out. So I'd have to like find the path around as much of the sand as possible. (laughs) And I was looking forward to, and I don't know, well, they probably didn't do it last year because COVID, but they had determined that the sand was clogging up the filter. It was like, yeah, duh. So they were going to take all the sand out. I'm like, oh, that'll be so much better because then we can just walk in and just wade around in the shallow end, you know, up to your ankles is not too big a deal. And she can watch the kids swimming and she just, she just loved to watch the kids and in inclement weather, which, you know, you guys have kind of like we do cooler days and wet days. And that's about as much yucky weather as we get. We'd go to the library, which is also not open at this point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just, the whole thing of like dealing with um, parents who have Alzheimer's and memory care during COVID, I just can't imagine. And I'm just really grateful that my mom wasn't around for that because if we weren't able to see her or, you know, or she was not able to come out of her room or, you know, uh, initially I know they were stuck in their rooms and they brought their dinners and breakfast and lunch and dinner to them in their room. I just can't imagine my mom would have gone crazy. You know, she would have not have understood why we didn't come visit her. And that just makes, I mean, that just tears my heart up when I see this on the news and everything, or when I hear that, you know, friends who have parents, or I have a friend whose husband, and he's only like 64, Mm. or six, you know, going to be 65. And he's in the memory. Well, he's not in the memory care. He's in the assisted living where my mom was in memory care. But she wasn't able to see him for months and months, months. It was just like, crazy. And finally, they were able to go sit with them for like 30 minutes 
on a little porch in the front. But I just can't, I just can't imagine. I mean, I'm just so grateful that my mom was gone by the time that COVID happened. I think my mom must have had like a moment or two of like clarity. This is what I like to tell myself anyway, because she was very like your mom, very combative. She did not think she needed help, took two caregivers to give her a shower. And she what they told me was that after her shower, she reached over to grab her clothes, slipped, landed on her kneecap, which broke the bones under right below the knee i'm pretty sure it was because she Uh. was fighting with them and this is no i blame nobody i mean other than mom but i don't really blame her either and i mean if it took two people to shower her and that still happened i mean like we probably should have gone to the rinseless wipes which i strongly encourage people to consider so that was march 8th 2020 she came back to the memory care on March 12th. I saw her the 12th, the 14th, and the 16th. And then the state of California closed down like completely March 17th. And and literally the 16th, I was there. The next day, they're like, nobody's coming in. And I thought, okay, fine. I can handle a week or so. And after a week, I was like, I'm really concerned that she's going to forget that I'm her best friend and not trust me. And that's going to be a really big problem because she's already combative. She told me to drop dead a couple of weeks prior to this happening. And I thought, you know, she doesn't recognize me as the nice person that takes her to go see children. We're going to have a big problem. So after a week and a half, I was like, okay, I haven't gone anywhere. I mean, I've worked from home for 16 years. My husband was going to the grocery store. There was no other place to go because everything was closed. I was literally about to call the executive director and say, I'm coming in. How do you want me to do it? You want to open the window in a room and I'll climb through? Like, what do you want? You know, I mean, it wasn't that. Yeah, I'm like, this is going to be beneficial for everybody. And they called and said she wasn't doing well. And so I went and saw her and then my sister went and saw her and she passed away the next day. Wow. I swear between... The increased fee because of the, I mean, she went from being able to walk to being wheel bed bound and wheelchair bound, not, you know, having to have somebody help her eat or feed her. I mean, she just went from somewhat self-sufficient to totally not self-sufficient. I mean, her, the cost for her care, like went up 50% and we had this whole COVID thing. So no going to see children. And so she was just like, I'm done. I'm out. Yeah. (laughs) Thank God. Exactly. Because I don't think window visits would have worked. They did have a bench, a couple benches out front, but that would have required somebody to bring her out. And I just, I really, really feel like the, I don't know about the government, but I think like the corporations that run a lot of those residents and families all need to get together and say, okay, well, you know, like people like Dr. Fauci are saying, yeah, this has been really bad, but this is not this is not like a one and done pandemic. Like, you know, we could actually have more. So we need to prepare and for this like horrifying thought, prepare that, you know, we could have other problems, hopefully not as severe. So this is obviously going to be a conversation that care homes need to have is like, how do we let family members in and keep everybody safe still? Because just preventing families from going in and seeing their loved ones has just been the horrors I've heard about just, it kills me. And I'm so glad that my mom was like, I'm done. I know. I'm out. <laughs> yes. I mean, she died on March 31st. So the, the higher fee didn't go into effect. I mean, it was like, I swear she had literally a split second of, of clarity. And she's just like, Nope, this is all bad. You know? So, cause, and I was really fine with the wheelchair. Cause I thought, man, we'll be able to get to other parts of parks and and get closer to the playgrounds with the kids. This will be great. I'll be able to move her around. Yeah, <laughs> so I was fine right. with it. But yeah, it's just crazy. But I do remember when I lost my train of thought a minute ago, one of the things that I wish I had done differently, I wish I had listened to guests a whole lot sooner, was I would go for two, two and a half hours. I literally blocked out Monday afternoons for mom. It was too much for her. Not maybe the first year, but we would have more and more problems. The longer I was there, the more problems we'd end up having. And was December 23rd, 
2019, I went, I picked her up for Christmas lunch, drove her around to the assisted living dining room. We got out. It was just her and I for lunch. We had a nice lunch and, you know, and, and they had really good food where she lived. And I gave her her one gift, which that was hard enough. Cause you know, you just want to shower them with love and gifts yeah. and everything. And we had the best time. I literally took her back to her room. Literally. I was there for like maybe an hour and 10 minutes from pulling into the parking lot to pulling back out. Best visit ever. And I'm like, Oh, Doing this from now on, and then it all went downhill from there. <laughs> it's not. That was, oh, she, I know. She fell. Well, but you know, we were. They encouraged us not to take take them out, mm. and we just knew that my mom. Once we took her out, she was not going back. Now I did have to. She got a UTI, and I did take her to the hospital, and she spent the night. And but the next day, she was pulling out her IVs, and mm. oh my god, it was just horrible. I, found you know she yelled at me when I was trying to get take her into the bathroom and told me to get out and so I like fine so I walked out and then 30 seconds later I opened the door and she's standing there like in a pool of blood with blood oh. everywhere she had pulled her IV out and we're like okay back to memory care this hospital situation is not working out and you know we took her back to the memory care that was the only time that we ever took her out mm. they told us you know it just it, when they you take them out it's always so much more difficult to get them once they're back to back to their routine so that's we interesting because i would actually take out there was one time well mom and diane diane mom and other diane and i would go out together a lot and there are people who still think that I was insane. They're like, why would you take out two women with Alzheimer's? I'm like, because they talked to each other and I didn't have to participate if I didn't they want friends, to. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like they could talk for about you, this. Jennifer, that's amazing. There was one family. That you, so they, did that. you know, it just, it worked. I mean, it was sad when other Diane started getting really paranoid and I couldn't take her with us because then I had to deal with my mom all by myself. <laughs> But there was one time I showed up. My mom didn't like it if I did her nails. So I was taking her to the, there was a literally, thankfully, a nail salon like five minutes down the street. It was I mean, it was like super close. And I got there and I said, oh, we're going to go get manicures. Isn't that going to be nice? You and I can, you know, we have a girly day. And my mom's like, oh, okay. Well, can my friend come? And I was like, oh, Lord. <laughs> like, okay. I'm like, okay, fine. And so I'm like literally taking both ladies out the door. I'm like, oh, wait, I probably should tell the care staff that I'm taking the other with me. <laughs> and so and they're like, oh, we better call her daughter. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's probably a good idea. I mean, they were so <laughs> used to my coming and going with mom and the other Diane that, you know, it was like they knew it was fine and I knew it would be fine. And, you know, the, the, they thought, oh, we better like maybe alert her family. And they were, they loved it. They were so grateful that I did that. And they're like, how do we pay you back? I'm like, just do something nice for my mom or somebody else's mom. Like, I, you know, what is oh, it? 15, 15, 20 bucks for a manicure. I'm like, not, you know, it's not going to break the bank. You know, so don't worry about it. And they had a great time together. And, and it was fun to like watch them interact in like a more natural setting. My mom did take about, um, six weeks to acclimate. So we didn't leave those first six weeks. I'm trying to remember when we started going out. She moved in March 16th. My dad's funeral was the 18th. So we took her out then. It probably wasn't that long. It was probably May of 2017 that I started taking her out. Part of it was just, I didn't want to deal with the other residents. You know, they would all try to talk at me and get me to help them with things. Like, no, I'm just here for mom. Like, please back. <laughs> <laughs> so taking her out actually was it just I don't know it was just good for both of us and what was funny there was one so September of 2019 my husband and I you know back in the days when you could actually fly places we had just gotten home from Denver and I don't know how many times you might have flown flown through the Denver airport every time we fly through Denver we get stuck and we got stuck coming home. So I did not get home until like one or two in the morning. And I am like not a nighttime person. I'm like, if it's daylight, I'm awake. If it's dark, I'm I'm out. You know, it's just the way it works. And I knew I was tired and I thought, you know, I better do something with mom. 
in the community because if I try to take her out and she gives me some sass or whatever, it just might, it just might roll downhill into just huge pile of negativity. And so I show up and it happened to be my wedding anniversary. So I brought my wedding album and I show up and she goes, Oh, where are we going? And I was like, Oh crap. <laughs> I was like, so I, that was how, how she saw me as the fun person that took her out. And we had a good afternoon that day, despite the fact that we didn't go watch kids, but and it did get a little bit harder at the end because she was just, she didn't want help and she needed it in taking her out. I would take her out in within the community. We'd walk around the whole complex. We'd go over to the assisted living side. We'd go to the assisted living's garden and patio area. Just a little change of scenery. I mean, it wasn't changed for me, but she hadn't seen it before. So it worked. What is um, next? You've done 20 episodes of your podcast. Well, I'm taking a break because I'm really um, decided I wanted to go back to the book, the book idea. So I just yesterday was the first day because I, I put out three weeks ago, I put out episode 20 and I decided that's the end of season one and that I, you know, I do want to do a season two. I'd love to do interviews like you, like you do. I'd love to interview like my dad and my my husband and my sisters and I would love to continue, you know, rotate with interviews, with telling stories about the year after and the healing and, you know, how I adjusted to life without my mom and how those lessons that I learned are still with me and how I'm learning how to take care of myself. But I think we were talking before we started today about self-care and self-compassion. And one of the things I wanted to, you know, I, I just really feel like I want to put this in a book form. Because there are stories that I didn't include on, on the journey. And I'd like to um, go back to it. I'm re-editing it and putting together and um, we'll put together a book proposal and try to um, pitch it and see if I can get a literary agent and get a publisher. The publisher that I had originally for my first book would not be right for this. So I would need to start from scratch. And then if I, I can get some interest, that's great. If not, I'd love to self-publish it or do an ebook, you know, because there's a lot of people who don't listen to podcasts, as you know, you know, especially older people, like all my we're, dad's we're friends. We're going to fix that. Stuff. I mean, we literally had to tell them, this is what you do. Take your phone. You have an iPhone. Okay. Go to the podcast app. You know, there's a lot of people who don't, or even young people don't. They're like, yeah, oh, I'll never listen to podcasts. So I really think that, you know, I'd like to get it out in a book form too. So Life in the A Zone is a book, or maybe I'll change the the title. Uh, there was this one, originally I was going to call it Don't Forget How Don't Forget How Good You Are, because that was the last words of wisdom my mom said to me after that hospital visit when she was so pissed off at me. And I was, I went back like a week later and just, I just did not end well that day in the hospital when I yelled at her for pulling out her IV. And Ugh. And she looked like a little girl who had been scolded and I was a mess and I felt awful. I was screaming for the nurse, screaming at mom, what did you do? Oh, it was just, it was not one of my better days. <laughs> so the next week I went to memory care unit and as to see her and as I was leaving, she was sitting in the chair and she said, she just looked at me and said, don't forget how good you are. And I was like, it was like it was coming from somewhere else. Like my mom's never told me that before. And I, was, I walked out going, wow, I so needed to hear that that day because I was beating myself up about how I had acted, you know, at the hospital the week before. And to hear her tell me that it was like my mom was barely talking at that point. Something so profound came out of, you know, don't forget how good you are. And I thought that would be a really great title to the book but now i have this brand of life in the a zone with the podcast so it'll probably be life in the a zone yeah i like <laughs> and that'll that. be a, su a I subtitle that. i like yeah i like the a life in the a zone that's really cool there's an author that i interviewed last year jack cohen he wrote a book called life on planet alls which is oh, really okay. you know so when i yeah. hear your title it reminds me of his and I think those are kind of catchy and they catch your interest. But I, I love that story. And it reminds me the Saturday before the shutdown for the COVID, I was with my mom and I'd brought, you know, because the one thing with the memory care 
I always knew that all of us were a team. I never expected the care staff to do stuff for me or in, you know, they, or do, do things for mom that I could handle, you know, if I was there, you know, we were a team to take care of mom. The one gal that was in charge of showers and oh, she got the brunt of mom's combativeness. She said, Oh, your mama, she's going to need like house coats, which was like, uh, no, my mom doesn't wear those. So I had brought, you know, really nice, soft, fuzzy night shirts and slippers that she never wore and like a, a bed jacket because, you know, they asked, she actually asked me to buy her dresses because they'd be easier to put on and off while she was in the wheelchair. So I'm really glad I didn't do that considering mom didn't last much longer after that. The one caregiver got my mom to like kind of laughing and smiling. My mom was asleep more than awake at this point. And so the last coherent words that I heard from my mom were, you know, time just flies. And, you know, I watched that video of her that I did, you know, the day after she died. And I was like, man, she must have known something was coming because it was just wild. It's a really, I find the brain so fascinating. And if I wasn't an artist and creative person, I might go into brain research, but I don't think I have the aptitude for that kind of science. I just find it fascinating. So are you familiar? Well, you, did you hear did you hear that Tony Bennett has Alzheimer's? They just announced it yesterday. Yes. And, you know, he still can sing. He still had been performing. And he's an artist, too. Mm -hmm. So he still was, like, singing and painting. And, you know, he still is, you know. But, well, the COVID shut down all the singing and stuff. But they still, he still goes in and, and sings, like, twice a week. He goes and they take him to into a studio and he sings. So it's amazing, you know. Um it's just amazing that, you know, they at the end, a mom could barely talk, but she, as a mom, she sensed that I needed to be told. That, That's always that amazing. Don't forget how good you are. You know, that you're a good daughter, basically, is to me, that's what I got out of that. I'm a good daughter and I need to remember. So I kind of like try to live by that now. Like, you know, I'm still forgiving myself of, you know, not behavior you know not reacting my behavior and reaction to her was I mean not I mean I I stumbled and I fell and I had to get up and try again and I you know I would get so frustrated and so angry and we would get in fights about her sh shower what she was wearing and it was just a battle it was a battle and I think that you know now I'm I'm really just trying to take care of myself and um, writing this again, you know, going back to the stories that I'd written and that I had recorded as the podcast and just going back and trying to get it, you know, all edited and, and adding some new things to it. And it's just been, it's just such a healing journey. And I just realized how much more healing I need to do. I'm doing yoga, I'm meditating, I'm praying. I, did you ever get that little book, Healing After Loss? No, I have to add that to my um, collection. It's by Martha Hickman. Every day, there's a a little there's a little quote. So, like t today is today the first or the second? The second, right? Today is February second. This will be coming out the first Tuesday of May. My the beginning of my season three. Okay, so like today, February second, it says it is true that grief extends our sensibilities. We find we have a sudden kinship with those who have suffered losses similar to ours. We may like the women in this Aggie story. There's a little story at the beginning who had recently been widowed, find ourselves in the awe of the strength in ourselves to simply go on living in the face of such suffering. We realize how much we have been spared not to have encountered this kind of grief before. And our hearts go out to those who are young and sustain a major grief too soon, or they have had carefree years to treasure. All of this comes as a kind of astonishment in the first period of grief. Like our plunging into cold water, it takes our breath away. That's beautiful. I'll definitely have to pick that up. There's definitely. Yeah, it's a great, there's a reading for every day. It's perfect. There's um definitely a journey of of finding yourself after caregiving, even if like myself, my mom was in the care home. It's, it's amazing how all of a sudden you've got this giant void and some guilt, but that's what you and I are here for with our stories and our interviews to 
to help people on the journey before, during, well, not necessarily before, but during and after. So I appreciate this. I really enjoy your podcast. So I'm encouraging everybody to take a listen to Life in the A Zone. It's it's a good companion to this one, or mine's a good companion to hers, depending yeah, on which direction you want to go. go. Hand in hand. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm on, I, it's on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And so, um, and it's on all the major podcast platforms. Yep. Me too. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.